Okay, so this is the next virtual lecture for EAPS 536. Uh, the topic will be the Madden-Julian oscillation, often shortened as uh, the MJO. Uh, in the reading, there's a small couple pages uh, on the MJO in Hartman Chapter 8.2.2, um, shown on the left there. Okay, so learning outcomes for today. Uh, first is to describe what the Madden-Julian oscillation is and how to identify it, uh, explain why the MJO exists, and explain what causes it to propagate eastward. So the MJO, Madden-Julian oscillation, we'll start with just some basics here. First, we're gonna watch a nice intro movie about the MJO. The Madden-Julian Oscillation, or MJO, is an important climate driver of tropical weather around the globe. While the El Niño Southern Oscillation and the Indian Ocean Dipole drive changes in Australia's climate on seasonal to annual timescales, the MJO can change the odds of a wetter or drier period on weekly to monthly timescales. So what is the MJO? It is an eastward moving zone of wind and cloud that circles the tropical areas of the globe in around 30 to 60 days. When that extra cloud arrives, it can increase the chance of receiving above average rainfall. However, ahead and behind the extra tropical cloudiness are regions where it might be drier. Okay, next we're going to move on to a movie that's going to show um, <clears throat> in much finer grain detail the evolution of the um, MJO. So this is looking at surface rainfall in millimeters per hour, um, as seen from the, the um, Global Precipitation Mission. Uh, so what you're going to notice, what you're seeing here, are is where precipitation is occurring. This is from 2014, um, and it's about you'll notice the grays going across. That's showing you when it's sunny and when it's when it's daytime and nighttime. So every a day occurs every about two seconds. And so you'll notice if you look by eye at some of these small clusters of precipitation, they are generally moving westward. So they, we have tropical easterlies. So Disturbances tend to move generally from east to west in the tropics. Um, and <clears throat> uh, yeah, and so if you track any individual cluster, they're moving east to west, which is what you would expect. But what you may not notice, and we're going to let this run through um, a second time, is that uh, there's actually a broader envelope of precipitation that moves from east, from west to east during this movie. And so we're going to let it finish. And then we're going to watch it one more time. OK, let's watch it a second time. So again, December 10th through January 20th, so a little over a month, about a month and a half um, in 2014. And so what I want you to notice is to kind of uh, zoom out as you look at this by eye. And notice that now, right now over the uh, Indian Ocean, um, so in the left half of the, the movie, there's kind of a broad envelope of blobs of precipitation that are together that are now kind of just east of India um, over the equator. This is the MJO, so it's not a nice, clean, simple picture as we saw before in that movie, um, but what it is is a broader envelope of precipitation that's gradually propagating eastward. So it's now generally moving over Indonesia and the maritime subcontinent. Um, and you'll notice now um, over just to the east of, the, of India, over the equ equatorial um, waters there, there's much less precipitation. So this blob of precipitation is gra very gradually moving towards the east. It's now over um, to the north of Australia and moving eastward off of um, again, the maritime subcontinent. Uh, and so it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to see. It's not obvious to jump out at you, but um, what it is is a broad pattern of precipitation that moves from west to east, even though the individual clusters of precipitation themselves may be moving east to west. Okay, so let's go back to kind of the cartoon view of the Madden-Julian oscillation. Um, so this is a really nice diagram showing you what 
Um, <clears throat> the circulation associated with this precipitating region is a, um, looks like. So um, you think of the MJO as a pulsing of organized enhanced rainfall. So we say pulsing just because it, it has periodicity to it, has a duration of about one to two months and a frequency of about one to two months. Begins generally over the Indian Ocean um, or the Western Indian Ocean. So that's how it's depicted here. There's this region of upward motion, though here it looks like it's just this magic big single cloud of rain um, uh, which as you just saw in the animation of precipitation is not true um, <clears throat> but um, yeah you see this kind of upper region of upward motion and it sort of should be reminiscent of a walk the walker cell type circulation it's again um, at the end of the day there's a um, you can think of this as a walker type circulation where you have upward motion um, where there's convection and then there's zonal outflow aloft uh, let's say at 200 millibars and then downward motion broad descent outside of the region of upward motion um, and then you have inflow at low levels here shown at 850 hectopascals um, um, and the greens are denoting some sense of moisture. So the air where it's green, the arrows are green, are moisture, and the arrows are, are brown, are drier. This is a really nice schematic. I like this a lot. And at the top, you'll notice it has the eastward movement, something like four to eight meters per second. Um, it's not a constant. Um, but so this entire envelope, this entire pattern shifts eastward over time. And we're going to see this. And so the key thing is this is really driven by internal atmospheric feedback. So it's an internal mode of variability in the atmosphere. So for as in contrast, we talked about the um, El Nino Southern Oscillation. That's a coupled atmosphere ocean response, um, a coupled atmosphere ocean feedback. This is purely an atmospheric feedback um, as far as we understand it. So this is something that's only starting to be better understood. We're going to learn some of the physics here um, in just a few moments. Okay, so let's start to visualize this MJO. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways of seeing this. Um, so we, you had looked at that movie of precipitation. So here's a nice um, uh, kind of composite view of the MJO as seen in precipitation. So this is actually from TRIM, the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. Uh, and the blues denote enhanced rainfall. So stronger rainfall, and the reds denote suppressed rainfall, which is reduced rainfall. And this is in units of millimeters per day. The color bar is at the bottom. So unfortunately, you have to keep, keep that in mind. Sometimes reds used to mean dry. Sometimes reds used to mean strengthened. So here, red means dry, blue means wet. Um, and so you'll notice here, so this is uh, broken up into, you'll see eight different uh, what we call phases of the MJO. This is following Wheeler and Hendon, 2004. Uh, um, which is how they characterize this, is you'll notice this um, gradual eastward transition. I think the easiest is to look at the blue blob, the enhanced rainfall, um, which in the early phases um, starts off over the Indian Ocean again as we start it, as it's where it's typically really the signal emerges and then it, it gradually moves eastward over time um, over the uh, <clears throat> the um, eastern Indian Ocean, over the maritime continent, what we call Indonesia and uh, the um, uh, land mass there, the many islands, and then gradually as you go down to phases six, seven, and eight, um, as it shifts off into the western equatorial Pacific and even approaching the central equatorial Pacific by phase eight. So this is one another way of thinking about this, and this is commonly discussed in terms of the phases. So where geographically and where zonally is precipitation enhanced, and then also precipitation then suppressed um, to the west and to the east of this kind of blob. Okay, so uh, here's another way to to characterize something very similar. Um, so here, this is what we call a Hovmuller diagram. So time in this case is going down on the y-axis and uh, longitude is on the x-axis, so going eastward to the right on the x-axis, and this is shown for two different years. The left plot is 1996 to 97, and the right plot is 2009 to 2010. And then the colors here now denote um, outgoing long wave radiation anomalies. So this is in average in 15, from 15 south to 15 north. Um, and they note here it's bandpass filtered. So this is from your book in Hartman, figure 8.7. Bandpass filter just means you're filtering out both low and high frequencies. So you're only, in this case, they're retaining 15 to 90 day periodicity only and removing everything outside of that range. 
And in this case, the blues indicate a negative OLR anomaly, which means um, enhanced, so reduced outgoing long wave radiation, which um, is because you have more deep convective clouds. So you're cooling to space from higher up in the atmosphere, from the tops of some of those clouds, which are at higher altitude, and so they're colder. So they emit less radiation um, from our basic Stefan Boltzmann equation, essentially. Um, and so again, blues indicate enhanced deep convective clouds. They're going to be associated again with enhanced precipitation. So, and then the reddish colors are positive OLR anomaly, um, <clears throat> which indicates you're radiating more out to space. So you have suppressed deep convective clouds um, and reduced precipitation. And the contour interval here is 10 watts per meter squared. Uh, and so we can look at one of these signals that jumps out. So let's again focus on the blue area, which is the precipitating regions. As you can see, these seem to be this pink arrow denotes this the propagation of the feature. So going downwards in time. So as time progresses, it's moving towards the east. Uh, <clears throat> And so we can see, highlight a few of these features. And so they have slightly different slopes. They don't always move at exactly the same speed. Um, but you can see a few of these features. And again, you can also highlight them in the reddish, looking at the reds as well. So um, however you want to do it, I'll I like to focus on the precipitating regions. That's usually what's done. So just a note, you can do a simple calculation is that it takes about to go 180 degrees longitude, so halfway across one of these diagrams in the x direction, takes about 60 days, it's about two months. So if you put in numbers for it's about 111.325 kilometers per, per degree longitude at the equator specifically, um, that gets you about 20,000 kilometers of dis zonal distance divided by 60 days converted to seconds, you have 86,400 seconds in a day. And you get about four meters per second here. So, um, and so that's just an approximate value that I put in. Um, as I said, it varies usually something like four to eight meters per second. All right, so we can then move on to um, another way of characterizing kind of the spatial pattern of the MJO, as well as importantly, how the MJO affects the large scale circulation. So this is figure 8.8 .8 from the book from Hartman. Uh, I encourage you to read a little bit more there because I'm not gonna be able to cover all the details of this. Um, but what is shown here is, so you'll see on each of these maps, on so the left side is what we call the first EOF, empirical orthogonal function, um, which generally corresponds to phase two to three of the MJO. And then the second EOF on the right is um, corresponds roughly to phase four to five of the MJO. And so what's shown in these plots, so in the top panels are the 200 hectopascal flow field, the arrows um, are the vector winds, and then the contours are are the OLR anomaly, so the outgoing long wave radiation anomaly. And so again, the, the here are the black colors denote negative OLR anomaly, so enhanced deep convective clouds or enhanced precipitation. And then the reds are um, positive OLR anomaly, which is suppressed deep convective clouds. And here the contour interval is two watts per meter squared. So what's shown here is actually what they've done is taken the wind vector, the wind field, um, a horizontal wind field and outgoing long wave radiation and, and regressed it onto these the first and second EOF of the 200 hectopascal and 850 hectopascal zonal wind um, for October to March, so the northern hemisphere winter time, um, which is generally when the signals are the strongest. And, uh, and so this is really just giving you a pattern of two, two of the dominant patterns of variability in the tropical atmosphere um, <clears throat> uh, on these time scales. So I think I didn't mention here this is band, I think this is low pass filtered um, in this case. So, but the long story short is what you're seeing essentially is two components of the same thing, which is the MJO. On the left side is the MJO really centered over the Indian Ocean, and then the right side is the MJO now moved to the east and um, over the maritime continent um, and just starting to move off the maritime continent into the western Pacific Ocean. Um, and so, yeah, so to highlight, so you've said a lot of words to highlight these, this MJO enhanced precipitation region. So notice that actually the contours are the same in the top and bottom rows. So you're just seeing the same thing as the OLR anomaly and that's not, that's at the top of the atmosphere. That's not specific to the, the wind, the 200 or 850 hectopascal levels, but the flow fields are different. Um, so 
I want to highlight, so at 850 hectopascals, you're seeing the arrows converging towards this enhanced precipitation region. So you have inflow towards the enhanced, this region where air is then rising um, in the, in the, primarily in the zonal direction. Um, and then aloft, you have uh, outflow, and it's predominantly actually going westward. So you don't see a strong signature eastward, but you see a much stronger signature westward. So you have inflow at low levels, rising motion in this enhanced precipitation region, and then outflow aloft going predominantly west. Um, and then I want to highlight, actually associated with this, is there's other features you'll notice. So that's what's cool about this approach, is you'll actually see then variability, um, what we call teleconnections, which is variability in the flow field, um, far removed from the actual MJO signal that we would typically focus on. So here you're seeing at 850 hectopascals in the bottom left to the circle, there's an anticyclonic circulation there. Um, and then at 200 hectopascals, there's a cyclonic circulation. So you generally have um, uh, <clears throat> a low-level or anticyclone associated with this at mid in the mid latitudes over the northern Pacific Ocean. Um, and then, so again, in the second um, uh, EOF, so later on, this MJO enhanced precipitation has moved to the east. Um, and so once again, you though you have inflow associated with the enhanced precipitation region, uh, inflow at low levels and then outflow at upper levels. And actually now it's a little bit more enhanced to the east, they're probably a little bit more generally symmetric in the outflow going west and east. Um, but then you'll actually notice that the, to the east, yeah, there seems to be a little bit of a kind of an, an acceleration farther east. Um, and so in this case, I'm just going to highlight there are also flow features far removed that vary with this MJO signal. But here you'll notice over the um, during this phase of the MJO that there's actually suppressed precipitation over the over the um, the Amazon, um, which is associated with this um, in part with this outflow um, uh, aloft going towards South America. So this is just want you to be able to orient yourself and see these teleconnection patterns associated with the MJO. And just last, I want to show you something because this is commonly used in the literature so you have some sense of what this is, and I encourage you to look a little bit more, is that so this Wheeler and Hendon work basically characterized the MJO in the context of these two EOFs that we just looked at. Um, <clears throat> and so what they did was they, they created a phase space where on the x-axis is what they called... Um, I actually can't remember what RMM stands for, but it's the first EOF, um, uh, the uh, a, a metric of the first EOF on the x-axis, and then the second EOF is on the y-axis. Um, and so we can use this to define the phase and the amplitude of the MJO. So you'll notice these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 going counterclockwise around this diagram. Um, so this is a diagram actually from 2020. Uh, and so, and each dot on here, the black dots are numbered, are um, by day, and the colors are months. So, and unfortunately, January and March are very similar colors, but you can see January in green, which jumps out in the top right side, and then there's February and March. So, this is stepping forward day by day in time. Um, <clears throat> and so, you're seeing the trajectory through this phase space where um, you can set, have a measure of what. Uh, phase you are in by which sector of this diagram you're in as you go around counterclockwise. Um, and so, yeah, and so the key thing, the other part is that the amplitude, how strong of a signal of, the, of these EOFs you have is denoted by how far from the center circle you are. So you can see January really jumped way out. Um, it's having large magnitudes of both EOF1 and EOF2. Um, so if you were at the very center, you would have basically zero amplitude of either of these EOFs. So you'd have no MJO signal at all. So when you go farther out, like essentially a radius from the center gives you a sense of how, what the amplitude of your signal is. Um, and so going around gives you, you're basically transitioning from a larger amplitude of EOF1 to a larger amplitude of EOF2 um, and smaller amplitude of EOF1 and then going positive and negative. So this is just to give you a sense of a way of diagramming this, and I encourage you to look more if you're interested um, at uh, these diagrams. The link is shown in the bottom left. And then last, I just want to emphasize that so this MJO has what we call teleconnections. So I just want to show you a map of teleconnections associated with, as an example, on the left is temperature composites by phase for um, January, February, and March over the United States. 
of um, changes in the in um, surface temperature, the daily mean surface temperature, um, where you see, for example, as you go towards from phase one, two, three towards phase four, five, and six, um, you see this pronounced warming uh, over the are going from cooling to warming over, say, here in Indiana. Um, and so the different amplitude of this is about six Kelvin. Um, I think, yes, yeah, this is in Kelvin, going from the cold to the warm um, uh, period. Uh, and then there are also precipitation changes associated with this, which is shown on the right. So generally, phases, uh, particularly phase six, for example, tends to be both warm and moist over Indiana and over the Midwest, um, or the Eastern Midwest, however you want to characterize it. So the key thing is this is not all statistically significant. So you have to be a little bit careful. And again, you can, the link is in the bottom left if you want to learn more and see other types of teleconnections associated with the MJO. But the key point is that um, even here in the US, there can be links to our weather can be linked, um, uh, can have significant linkages with the MJO far, far away on the other side of the world and in the tropics. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the physics of the MJO, which is pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to understand the physics by starting with something that might seem totally unrelated, but we'll eventually get to why it is very related. Um, is <clears throat> So if given enough time on the order of tens of days, convection actually can spontaneously self-aggregate into a cluster in uniform non-rotating radiative convective equilibrium. So that's a lot of words. What does that mean? Um, <clears throat> so in the top box, this is just a box, a square doubly periodic box with a domain side length of about 200 kilometers. What you're seeing in the colors is the surface temperature, um, which is in Kelvin, which is around 300 Kelvin, you know, the reds. Um, <clears throat> so a typical tropical sea surface temperature. And you notice there are these blues and, and yellows and greens, which are associated with cold pools beneath uh, uh, convective clouds. So the whites are showing you, let's play this again, the whites are showing you uh, isosurfaces of condensate amount, liquid and ice. You're actually seeing the sort of outer edges of the volumes of clouds. And so on the top, you'll notice that the clouds seem to be sort of randomly, somewhat randomly distributed in the domain. So this is what we say, a uniform domain, constant sea surface temperature, and there's no rotation here at all. The atmosphere is just cooling to space, and so there's convection to balance that radiative cooling, convective um, upward uh, convective heat fluxes to balance that radiative cooling. And so that's what in the form of clouds. Um, transporting heat upwards. So what's amazing though is in the bottom column or bottom movie what you'll notice is that all the clouds seem to be clumped together into uh, what we call an aggregated state of convection. So <clears throat> um, yeah and so so this transition um, so why the, in the top top box the box is small enough that it actually inhibits this from occurring for complicated reasons but the bottom box is big enough where it can occur and it does so this is again taken several tens of days um, where now the clouds are all clustered together so most of the domain is warm and there's no precipitation um, <clears throat> and no clouds at all the air is just subsiding and now all the all the clouds and precipitation are clustered together into an aggregated state um, as shown in the diagram below or in the movie below. Okay, so the question then is, so why does that matter? We'll come back to this. Um, so we, the question we want to answer is what creates the MJO and why does it move eastward? Um, so we're going to focus on a paper. This is Kruten of an Emanuel 2018 um, in Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. Um, and it really discusses how an MJO forms and moves in an aqua planet um, without SST gradients. Uh, and so I'm going to pop up the abstract here, um, which you can read through, uh, pause and read through if you'd like in more detail. I'm going to highlight a couple of, sec of sentences in here that we'll focus on. So what they do is they simulate radiative convective equilibrium states on a rotating sphere. So now we're allowing for the rotation of a sphere with constant sea surface temperature um, using a, a cloud permitting model. And they're going to do. They also do some mechanism denial experiments that reveal that cloud radiation interaction is the quintessential driving mechanism of the simulated MJO-like disturbances. 
Um, and lastly, that the wind-induced surface heat exchange feedback, called WISHI, um, it are the primary driver of its eastward propagation. So we're going to come back to what that means. And the full paper citation is provided in the bottom left. Okay, <clears throat> so what do they do? Uh, so we're going to focus first on the left figure, um, which shows the state of the distribution of precipitable water, so total column water basically, at two different days early in the simulation at day 15 and later in the simulation at day 280. And so they use a, quote, near global domain. So it is uh, 46 south to 46 north, uh, shown here um, <clears throat> uh, on the left. So, and then they have um, what they call an aqua planet, which is no land, but an SST is equal to 300 Kelvin everywhere. And so, note, so this is in a rectangular box, but the F is allowed to vary as it does on the sphere. So it is a, it's not a beta plane, it's actually a sphere-like sphere variation of F. So F does vary with latitude, but it's not a constant variation with latitude as you'd find in a beta plane. The zonal boundaries are periodic, so stuff that goes out the right side pops out the left side, just like it does on the real Earth. So sometimes we call this a zonally reentrant channel. Uh, and the north and south boundaries, the meridional boundaries, are solid walls that are free slip, which is to say that nothing can go through the walls, but the walls themselves do not exert, exert, exert any frictional drag on the flow. The flow can just slide by freely, can freely slip along the boundary. Okay, so <clears throat> um, so let's walk through the diagram or the figures on the right to show the the time evolution of what happens in the simulation. And the left diagram on the right side is precipitation, and the right side the right diagram is precipitable water. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll notice that initially. Um, the precipitable water is nearly uniform, so you have values of approximately 50 millimeters of, of column water um, everywhere in the domain at the outset. So it starts with a tropics-like domain that's horizontally homogeneous. Um, and so what happens is that convection and precipitation and moisture tend to self-aggregate into clusters um, or into, we'll just say, self-aggregate somehow. Um, so notice that first the blue curve goes downward, which indicates that dry regions are forming first, which is something that's actually also seen in those uniform box simulations like I showed before. And then soon after that, um, moist convecting regions start to form next. So this is shown by the maximum. So the red line shows the, the largest values of precipitation, precipitable water in any given column, and the blues are the minimum. Um, and then eventually over time, so there's um, this aggregation process occurs where now re moist regions become moister and dry regions become much drier. And eventually if you wait long enough, um, the system reaches a statistical equilibrium. So beyond something like day 140, um, things become relatively stable statistically um, within the domain. But obviously things are still moving around and interesting things are happening. So most of these processes occur over the first 40 to 60 days, uh, but to wait until a true equilibrium equilibrium is reached takes something like 100 or more days. So again, the key thing is order of tens of days for these processes to occur. And then lastly, just to note, um, in, the, in the system on the left, you'll notice at high latitudes, those, those really circular clusters are most likely tropical cyclones, actually. Uh, but for this work, we're really focused on the near, the near equatorial region, which is where the MJO is going to form. So you can actually see by eye um, this clustering by day 280, where you have these uh, moist regions and dry regions that have formed. Um, and, and at day 15, even, you can already start to see them. So there's some quality qualitative differences by I in, in the distribution of, of things going on in the system. All right, so we can look at um, Hovmuller diagrams of, um, here they're looking at precipitable water anomalies. So time now is going upwards in this case, but um, the x-axis going left to right is, again, longitude. Um, and in this case, reds indicate higher precipitable water and blues indicate lower precipitable water. So reds indicate moist regions in this case, which is the opposite of what we did before. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this red region is a moist region of enhanced convection. Uh, and you'll notice that there's, again, now things are going, the slope is upwards um, to the right because time is going upwards. So things are propagating again towards the east. 
um, that's what's shown by these pink arrows. And so the thing to note here is this is really one continuous propagating disturbance. So because um, this is just going around the, the world in quotes, um, so what pops out from the right side, what goes out on the right side pops out on the left side. This is one propagating disturbance that does have some variability with time. Um, so it takes about 60 days to circumnavigate the globe. So that's the period of this, this disturbance. Um, and so once you know the distance around the circumference of the Earth at the equator, you can again translate this to a translation speed, which is um, about 8 meters per second in this case. So this one is on the faster end of the disturbance um, speed. Uh, additionally, you can look at this in the context of the frequency wave number space that we spent quite a bit of time on in class learning about, um, plot, prop, or plotting the uh, dispersion relations of different waves. Uh, and so the, what I'll focus on here is the left one is the symmetric, so symmetric about the equator, um, so both north and south, southern hemisphere. Um, is symmetric and so just highlight here the MJO spectral signature going back to where we saw this in the um, when we learned about these different types of waves this is the spectral signature this little blob at low frequency so it's very slow and low wave number it's relatively long length scales um, it's close to a wave number one disturbance um, which is to say one one wavelength all the way around the globe <clears throat> All right, uh, and so what they do in this study is they look at, and so I should say that previous plot was again from, they calculated that from their simulations. And now in these plots, what they've done is looked at, created a composite MJO and looked at different, um, different quantities. So on the top left is the precipitation um, <clears throat> and the center of that precipitation disturbance is shifted just to the west of zero degrees longitude. I'm not actually sure why that is the case. I believe this is centered on minimum pressure. So precipitation, I guess, peaks to the a little bit to the west of the the minimum surf, um, surface pressure. Um, the top right is column moist static energy, um, and so just as a reminder, so I'm going to put this. This is defined as m. Um, so moist static energy is defined as m as per unit mass. So they use m instead of h. And so column moist static energy is you're integrating the moist static energy over the total mass of the column, which is written here as 1 over g times the integral from the surface to the top of the atmosphere of the mass times the, the pressure. And now I realize there should be a minus sign on that or you'll get a negative. Um, <clears throat> so that's what's plotted in the top right. So what does this mean? It's um, just telling you the regions where it's red, where there's higher column moist static energy, first and foremost means that they're moister. That's essentially what they're telling you again. These variations in moist static energy in the tropics tend to be predominantly variations in moisture rather than temperature. Um, <clears throat> and then everything is at the same altitude generally, so there's not really variations in potential energy. And then the bottom left is showing you the vorticity signature. So you're seeing positive vorticity. Um, so it's easier to look, think about the northern hemisphere. So north of the equator, you have positive vorticity to the west and negative vorticity to the east. Um, uh, off the equator, and then you can also see the vorticity signature at the upper levels as well, so that lower left is the lower levels. Um, oh, and so I should have mentioned, yeah, so again, the MJO is a region of enhanced moisture and precipitation, so shown on the left, the top left and top right, so this means high moist, high column moist static energy. Um, so you'll notice there's also some signatures of a Matsuno, Matsuno Gill type response as well. So what does that mean again? If you remember, is there's a little bit of an equatorial Calvin wave extension to the east, uh, and then these off equatorial Rossby wave extensions to the west. So there are some wave-like responses in this system as well. Um, yep. Okay, so why are we talking about column moist static energy? So this is their focus. It's, it's a really nice diagnostic way to think about uh, any sort of moist disturbance um, or region where you have high moisture content relative to its surroundings. So look at column moist static energy. Um, and so this plot on the left, so this shows the, um, the figure from Emmanuel 2019 in Jazz, showing that again, typically you have lower moist static energy in the free troposphere. Um, there's a minimum there, so just as a reminder of how moist static energy typically varies with altitude. 
Um, and so what they do is you can write a budget equation for the column integrated moist static energy. So looking at the column integrated value simplifies the problem a lot because there's only a few things that can actually change your column integrated moist static energy. So the first is actually the first three terms on the right hand side of this equation, which is the advection. Um, so I should say the tendency is on the left side. So the local rate of change of the column integrated moist static energy can be changed by advection. So just the flow bringing in higher or lower values of, of column integrated moist static energy. Um, and this is actually more complicated than I'm making it seem. Um, there's a lot more detail in the paper on this because this is quite important. Um, is that this is associated with how the circulation can either import or export moist static energy um, into a column. So, uh, but we're not going to focus too much time on that. I just want to highlight they actually separate out the translation speed of the MJO itself. So they're shifting to an MJO um, frame of reference in some sense. Um, so that's why this left this first term advective term appears. So next, you can add or you um, can change the column integrated moist static energy through surface enthalpy fluxes, which is generally going to be positive, which is to say that there's generally evaporation or a transfer of heat from of uh, sensible heat from the surface to the overlying atmosphere because the overlying atmosphere is usually or the overlying surface air is usually um, subsaturated and it's usually a little bit colder than the surface as we talked about in the previous lecture so um, so evaporation so enthalpy fluxes in general add to tend to um, put energy into the column um, and then the last term, which is really, you can think of it as two terms, but it's really a single term, is the net radiative heating um, in the column. So, which is to say that you have an upward radiative flux from the surface. So there's also radiative fluxes from the surface, the surface radiating and, um, and that radiation being absorbed into the, um, or I just should say, should, is transferred into the column and it can be absorbed by um, constituents such as water vapor or carbon dioxide. Um, in the overlying atmosphere, and so that will tend to heat the atmospheric column, and so that's again uh, a source of sensible heat for the column, which again in, um, increases the column integrated moist static energy. And then at the top of the column, there's an upward radiative flux out of, of the column into out to space. So the net, the difference between the energy flux, the radiative energy flux coming in and energy radiative energy flux going out is the net radiative heating of the column. Um, and so if that's positive, that means you're uh, heating the column. And so there's a, your column integrated moist static energy is increasing. Okay, so why is this nice is that you can actually look at these tendency terms and calculate these tendency terms for the composite MJO, which is what they do in the paper. Um, <clears throat> and so I've left the equation on the right-hand side. We're going to walk through these terms here. Uh, so can we understand what's causing this? So first is um, you'll notice that the net radiative heating term is positive centered right over where the MGO disturbance is centered itself. So where M is already large. So this is a positive feedback. It says that M, the column integrated M is already large and this tendency term is trying to make it even larger. So it is, um, and it's, you'll notice that it's, so that is helping to maintain the MJO. And that is the term that does it, is this net radiative heating. So physically, what does this mean? Is that um, where you have this MJO disturbance, you have more clouds and moisture. And so you have a stronger greenhouse effect. So it's predominantly a long wave feedback. Um, so you're trapping more long wave energy in the column than you would otherwise. And so, whereas in the drier regions, um, you can lose that energy rapidly to space. Um, so you can think of it as effectively the column is cooling radiatively to space at a colder temperature than it would be other without the clouds. So this is a clouds and moisture feedback that helps to maintain the MJO. Uh, and then second is you'll notice that the surface flux term tends to be increasing col um, this uh, column integrated MSE to the east of the MJO. So this is a feedback that causes it to propagate eastward, and it's specifically and predominantly this term. Um, the advection is also a bit a part of it, but it's mostly this term um, that's just a quarter wavelength essentially to the out of phase to the east of the disturbance itself. So physically, what is this coming from is that surface fluxes increase with wind speed. So just as if you go outside on a windy day, you'll get colder faster. 
um, because the wind is extracting heat from you. And surface wind speeds are strongest to the east of the system. So you can actually go back to see the, the flow patterns at a 50 hectopascals to see this is that. So there's easterly inflow associated with the MJO, even thinking about back to the cartoon diagram we showed. And then there's also background equatorial easterlies. So those add together. It's the absolute wind speed that matters. And so you end up with surface winds that are strongest to the east of the MJO disturbance. And so surface fluxes are strongest there, are acting to enhance the MJO, or the enhance the uh, column moist static energy to the east, and actually decrease, they actually um, interfere destructively to the west, and so wind speeds are very weak to the west. Um, <clears throat> hence you get that asymmetry in the surface flux term. So we can actually go one step further um, and do something that is called, often called mechanism denial experiments, which is really cool. And I want to show you this as a way of how you can test your hypotheses very explicitly using models, why models are really great. So these are Hovmeyer diagrams for a bunch of different experiments. And so the, and the left one is the control where you're seeing an MJO-like disturbance as before. And I'm just going to highlight two of these um, experiments here. So first, as we talked about this, this um, wishy feedback. So what do we mean by that? So again, the surface enthalpy flux equation can be written um, as shown here is F naught is typically written as the density times the uh, an exchange coefficient, which might be constant, times the absolute wind speed times the enthalpy disequilibrium, which is the difference in, in enthalpy between the surface, which is saturated, and the air overlying it, which is subsaturated and also a tiny bit cooler. So it's, the, it's the combination of latent and sensible heat. So the key thing is when we say this idea of wishy, which is a term that's commonly used, and I really want to emphasize this, this stands for wind speed induced surface heat exchange feedback. So wishy feedback. Um, it's really the first five words there. It's just saying that surface enthalpy fluxes depend on wind speed. So if your wind speed is larger, your surface enthalpy fluxes are larger. Period. That's all it's saying. It's a very simple idea and uh, not a controversial idea in its own right. So what if you took your model and you ran your experiment and you simply turned this wind speed dependence off? And you do that by setting the wind speed equal to the average wind speed in the entire domain and just keep it constant everywhere. So you don't let there be any wind speed, um, surface wind speed feedbacks um, in the surface enthalpy flux equation. That's it. You don't change the actual winds, you just change the surface enthalpy fluxes themselves. And magically, you get no more MJO. There's basically nothing there. You see no propagating disturbance and really not very little variability in, um, and I should have said this is in OLR anomalies, so um, which is pretty remarkable. You're getting something that removes this variability almost entirely. And then we can also do one other experiment is what if we don't allow radiative feedbacks? So we had said the radiative feedbacks are important for maintaining the MJO, but they don't govern its, its, its propagation. So you do this by setting the radiative heating rate as a function of altitude to be constant everywhere equal to its mean. Um, so there's no variability in radiative heating. Uh, and you get a much weaker MJO, though you still have a similar translation speed. So again, wishy is still there, so you can still have the, the mechanism that gives you the translation speed, but it's a much weaker disturbance now. So the, clearly the radiative feedbacks are quite important. They're not perhaps essential to the existence of the MJO, but they're important for its strength, clearly. And one last step for more proof that Wishy is really, really fundamental here is what you can do is take your control simulation and then instantaneously at day 280 here, turn off that wind speed dependence of the surface fluxes. And notice that the MJO just suddenly stops moving um, and it very rapidly uh, disintegrates or very rapidly decays, I should say, in place. And it nearly disappears. It doesn't totally disappear, um, you could argue, but it nearly disappears. So, um, so again, wishy, this wind speed dependence of surface fluxes is incredibly fundamental to um, uh, tropical variability in general um, in, in the atmosphere. It's also very fundamental to hurricanes as well. So. Okay, so just to summarize, just want to emphasize the MJO, the Madden-Julian oscillation, is not itself really a unique wave mode. It can look like a wave because it propagates, but it's probably better thought of simply as a coherent disturbance. 
Um, and it's a disturbance that emerges from slow, so order 10 days or longer, feedbacks between moisture, radiation, and circulation. So people increasingly think of it as sort of a self-aggregation phenomenon um, in the tropical atmosphere. So similar to going back to those movies at the beginning of the slow self-aggregation of convection that then also happens to propagate eastward um, due to the processes discussed um, before. So if you'd like more information, um, as well as uh, a remarkable analytical solution for the behavior of this MJO-like disturbance in this paper, I encourage you to read this Kurutnov and Emanuel 2018 paper. It's really pretty awesome, and I think somewhat accessible, or reasonably accessible in that, I'd like to highlight these, this, it's a really awesome way of how you can use idealized computer modeling experiments to do experiments to test our fundamental understanding of how certain um, uh, phenomena work in our atmosphere. All right, go to Blackboard to answer a few questions about this topic.